Sure. So, uh, my name is Derek Rath. I'm a former law group. Uh, I've been doing a lot of work and sort of helping put together Chag. Folks here at the table, and many of the rest of you are here in the room. Um, you know, we're here working today to really try to uh, determine and push forward with respect to legislative agendas and, and ensuring that Colorado re remains at the forefront of the hemp industry. Um, with that, I see my colleague Bob Hogan here as well. I think I know just about everybody in the room. I'm Bob Hogan. It's good to see you all. Uh, thanks for coming today. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I thought it was just. <laughs> yeah. I am Russ Orsborn. I, I do the farming for BJM. I've been doing that for most of my life. I'm Mark Gray. I'm the president of the School of Botanicals. We do cotton bowling and some regular CBD hydro hip stuff and hemp as well. Sherry Moran, the color of purple bag. Tim Burton, Question Revenues, and that's why I think it's just right here. Tom Yerby, Fusion Hub. Ron Bassett Smith, Sada Packaging. David Bush, I'm with the Hellman Law Group. Shannon Pega, I actually am kind of a creator, but I'm not sure I'm here for that. Dwayne Sang, Division Director of Plant Industries. Jeff Barnes, Division Director of Environmental Health and Sustainability. <laughs> I'm Don Rozier, a uh, former Jefferson County Commissioner, um, actually involved in the hemp industry. Great. And uh, Mark Slaw with iComply. Great. Uh, Veronica Carpio with Grow Hemp Colorado. Great. Um, so the purpose of this meeting today is to just kind of go over um, and exchange information about what we're thinking with the 2019 legislative session, knowing that we have a new governor coming in, a new CBA commissioner, we have 2090 House members below us, so we have a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, interesting challenges ahead um, of us. Um, so I'd love to see if um, um, any of the departments have hemp as part of the regulatory agenda for next session, either through the legislature, um, or, or if there are any sort of regulatory scheme that's already have in place. Um, then we'd like to talk about some of the um, some of the challenges and opportunities we think will be coming forward during the next legislative session. Um, so uh, I know you guys have to go through clearance on the first floor. Do you guys have any hemp related stuff on your guys' agenda for next session or? No. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. So just nothing straight up to date. Okay. Nor did the job yeah. yeah, nor did the department. Okay. Okay, great. Um, uh, so I'll just start off from our end then. Um, uh, one of the one of the bigger issues we anticipate next session is going to be um, the the marijuana sunset. Um, on the marijuana side, um, the big change over there is just going to be merging medical and rec markets. But there are two hemp related recommendations in there. They are recommendations four and five. Um, uh, uh, um, recommendation four would basically require um, hemp derived CBD to be put through the metric system. Um, whereas five would allow them to be, it would allow to have direct CBD to still be sold in marijuana dispensaries. Um, there's still a lot of conversations with regard to the sunset itself. Nora's position is that either both of those recommendations go forward or neither recommendation goes forward. And there's some folks in the marijuana community that have also had that, um, had that position from conversations that, um, that we have amongst our fellow lobbyists. Um, the process for that in February, there was like the Senate year for sunsets. And so the, um, the sunset process um, will start off probably like early February in Senate finance and then move over to the House as that, as that bill comes together. Um, the meeting of the sunset folks at Dora on another issue yesterday, apparently the bill is like 80 pages as drafted. So it's gonna be a long process and those two recommendations are one of them gonna be 27 that are in there that aren't germane to him at all. But um, so it's just something that we're gonna be um, staying on top of. Um, do Garrett, Bob, do you have anything to add to that? I think just conceptually, you know, where we see hemp in general. And this is based upon soliciting input from you know, many stakeholders is ensuring that there's no special treatment as it relates to the marijuana system. Uh, certainly, you know, we're open and obviously, you know, as any commercial business would be interested um, uh, in you know, having the opportunity to sell through a new channel of distribution, like the, you know, with the marijuana dispensary shop. Uh, but that said, um, also being careful to ensure that there's not this commingling or confusion between the two. Um, uh, 
And so I'm sure, again, it's just effectively the, the no special treatment sort of uh, concept uh, from the sense of metric tracking, from the sense of you know, how the, are those products specifically allowed on shelves as opposed to all consumables being allowed on shelves. Um, the idea on the batch testing side in terms of bulk oil being sold into dispensaries, um, you know, the idea of redundant testing within the marijuana testing facilities, and that's effectively a recommendation for it. If someone is engaging in testing outside of the system, is that sensible policy to require redundant testing within the system? Um, so those are all things that we're looking at. Again, I think that there's, there's some other uh, interests in play there in terms of the those recommendations um, and the marijuana interest as well. So but from our perspective, we remain open to ways in which we can you know, certainly create more opportunity for the hemp industry through bulk or finished product sales, but obviously want to make sure that we're, you know, for, uh, uh, retaining the integrity of how hemp is treated as an agricultural commodity uh, and as a food additive uh, under the laws that the department has already been with. Yeah. Are there any questions from the public about that at all? I don't think so. Okay. I have a question. Sure. Can you elaborate further on what you're talking about regarding CBD going under metric? Um, well, it's set out in recommendation number four. I don't have any document of what you're referencing, but if you could elaborate, that would be awesome. Um, um, it's, if you just Google the sunset, it, you can find it. So, like, I, I'm just here to convey my client's information. Okay, so what exactly does that mean? Are you saying all CBD from hemp and MJ going through metric? Again, if you Google the recommendations online, you can find out what it is. Okay, thank yes. you. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is on the news yesterday, the farm bill passed, I heard in like marketing yesterday, um, and um, um, industrial hemp um, will no longer be um, federally illegal. Um, what we will be looking for is the next steps is once that gets signed, what the USDA rulemaking looks like, what rules and guidance in their good states. Um, and we, um, what we don't, like it's about a 50-50 coin flip if we get any of that guidance until the end of the legislative session, we may have to run some implementing legislation here in Colorado. We just don't necessarily know what that looks like right now. Um, uh, it, it's especially if the bill just passed yesterday and has yet to be signed by the president. Um, so we're gonna kind of put a pin in that for now and just keep uh, keep vigilant on top of that. Um, anything else I might have missed on that one, Greg? No, I mean, I think a lot of this wait and see, right? You know, we have to, I'm sure the departments are well aware of, you know, right now we're speculating as to exactly how those rules are gonna play out at the federal level. And so, you know, obviously we wanna remain, you know, keep the integrity, of, again, of what Colorado has already built, but, you know, we kind of need to understand what the landscape looks like at the federal level before uh, doing anything. So that's, I think, you know, just a, you know, certainly front of mind issue, but one in which we don't have anything specific on uh, to date. Um, we also should perhaps back up to a little bit um, on the med stuff mm -hmm. uh, with respect to the work group that we convened mm -hmm. um, on Monday, uh, starting on Monday with respect to, I know there's been great discussion amongst CDA, CDPHE, uh, and AC, um, and other agencies with respect to uh, processing of hemp and reporting requirements, et cetera, and how to treat those oils. So um, again, with that function, you know, we have great concern with respect to you know, some of the comments and or perhaps directions uh, being suggested based upon uh, the prior uh, stakeholder meeting convened a few months ago by the agencies. Um, and so, but again, we wanna respect the process of the work group to kind of see where that process plays out. Um, but it certainly is something that uh, from the hemp industry is very much front of mind and causes great concern to the extent that um, any agencies want to commingle or confuse or collapse hemp with marijuana. Um, and so again, without given that there's a, a lack of detail to date, I'll leave it there in terms of that, you know, conceptually speaking, to us it's a very bright line. And any uh, attempt to try to blur that line uh, presents concern and problems to many within the hemp industry. And so again, it's maintaining the integrity and the distinction between hemp and marijuana. So that's with that. Go ahead. I was gonna ask you, what are you seeing just in what you've heard that creates that blur on that? So, I, I mean, that the you know, existing allowances for cultivation of hemp, or not cultivation, uh, testing of raw hemp in marijuana testing facilities, but then, um, you know, the convening of that stakeholder meeting a few months ago mm -hmm. and then the testing of processed oil 
uh, through uh, med uh, testing facilities, which again, what to be clear, are not necessarily opposed to, to the extent that then the marijuana industry or the med is then seeking to bring it into their system effectively uh, uh, altogether. We're, you know, we're open to options that provide greater um, ability and opportunity for hemp stakeholders to get the services they need, whether that be testing or otherwise. But again, so long as we can you know, maintain that integral distinction between the two. And in terms of you know, things that you've heard, you've heard things about you know, trying uh, recommendation four and five, trying to redundantly test within the marijuana testing system, needing to put metric um, you know, uh, attached to either raw hemp or uh, processed oil, how to deal with the THC component. You know, we've, Jeff, you and I have long discussed this in terms of, and, and Laura, uh, um, although she's no longer with the CDPHE, uh, the idea of kombucha, right? I mean, it's well known that there's this concentration of THC um, uh, above 0.3% during the processing of hemp. But in general, that, you know, we, we don't necessarily see that as an issue per se in the sense that, you know, those products are not hitting the market. That's more of a kombucha-like function. That said, I understand there's concern from regulators and or uh, uh, law enforcement as to, is there a diversion issue there? Um, I, you know, I'm not sure that there's a definitive answer to that question. I would contend that the answer to that question is no. That said, we're willing to engage in, and cooperate in discussion with stakeholders in terms of identifying what, if any, what if any issues there are, and if so, how to sensibly regulate that. But again, sensibly regulate uh, regulate that issue in the sense of this is like corn and wheat and food additive, not like marijuana. And so, to the extent then that there's this marijuana treatment imputed upon hemp by virtue of, of this concern, you know. Uh, I'm hard pressed to give specifics right now in terms of what that looks like just because we have a work group process to go through. But to the extent that we start veering off in that direction, I, I can foresee that that's a great concern to the hemp industry. Um, with, in light of the Farm Bill's passage in the past, uh, you know, this week, the hemp industry and many, a lot of hemp industry stakeholders are talking to the likes of Costco, Walgreens, CVS. The more that this goes away of marijuana, those conversations cease. And so again, there's a lot of interest there in terms of how do we make this appropriately like ag an agricultural commodity and food additive and not like marijuana. And so it's when you start bringing in those other issues that that becomes problematic. Yeah, I think where we're at, um, and I don't think this means from within the discussions of the stakeholder group is the assured of that. Mm -hmm. How do you get that assured? So, we're open to different ways to do that, but the assurity can't be compromised. I mean, that's, I feel confident saying that in, in our role as our agency. And so how do we do that? Yeah, that's I, that's the, the, the behavior in the conversation. And, 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 and I think that that's the question everyone is, you know, rightfully and, and understandably wrestling with. Yeah, and I, I don't think there's any one answer to that. Um, I don't either. You know, uh, speaking for myself, I come to the table with an open mind in that sense but also being very clear that in the sense that it goes in the direction of marijuana, you know, there will be a hard stop there. Um, so. I, I would say, Jeff can hear it from me. I don't have quite as open mind as you probably do. Uh, I have a, a very closed mind. This is an agricultural product and we're going to treat it that way. Uh, how we get there, that. <laughs> how we get there may be more difficult than than just one agency, and that's why the agencies have all come together and why we've got stakeholder groups. Because uh, we have seen growing in the past. We've seen issues where marijuana has snuck into the hemp world, and that's created problems that now we're, we've got to tackle going the other way. This way. And, and, and certainly that, you know, that's absolutely appropriate. We want to figure that out. Um, what I would also say is that there's issues in just about any industry, right, in terms of bad actors. And I, we want to make sure that the conversation is any view that might be those bad actors and find a way to sensibly regulate so that doesn't undermine. I, I wasn't talking about bad actors. I yeah. was talking about legislation. Oh, okay. There you go. There you go. In yeah, some yeah. cases. So, uh, so I, I think we all share your concern and, and we have had uh, between the agencies very open and honest discussions that have fallen up, sometimes not always uh, us agreed on. Uh, but that's why we've also
also said it was important for us to get stakeholders together so that we can solve this because this is an extremely difficult issue. Uh, like you said, the potential for diversion, all, all those things. How do we sort that out? And not just from a regulatory side, how do we include stakeholders that, that may help us get better solutions than we're going to find ourselves? I mean, and that's, candidly, that's the whole point of a meeting or a forum like this, right? Is to bring everyone together and not just for the folks in the center, but from everyone in this room. Uh, we're open to suggestions here. I mean, we're actively soliciting input from a number of different folks, especially those coming from other industries that perhaps have um, methods that can be adopted and, and analogized into this particular situation. So again, I can't speak with specifics in terms of there's one definitive method and it's our way or the highway. I don't think that's the case at all, but I can tell you this conceptually at a high level of, you know, we don't want to see blur, we want to see clarity such yes. that it allows the hemp industry to ripen into what it rightfully should be. I think that um, if we were writing, if we were just talking about industrial hemp and if the seeds stopped in fiber, we'd be in CDC. We're not probably here. You're not smoking that, right? <laughs> <laughs> but we're not. It's the it's the flower that is creating the, you know, how, do, how do we handle it? I mean, that's just, that's the reality and that's fine. You can figure out a way to deal with it. But that, um, in a way, after 2000 rounds of dealing with that, Makes it makes it a little different than um, corn and wheat, in my perspective, you know, in my perspective. Well, but the flower. When we start talking about the flower, though, we start talking about that in the sense of post processing, which is where. It's, then so exactly. yeah, so it's us. It's no so at, yeah, yeah. Process. yeah, so at the my point about corn and wheat is at the raw stage okay. when it's I under the department of ag stage is corn and wheat. Okay. Then as we start moving into your department stage, then we have to figure out how do we keep this as you know as a food additive yeah. um, and account for these issues. Okay. So. Um, I just would add one thing, and, and again, thank you for your commentary. I, I leave for Washington, D.C. this afternoon, and, and we've got some pretty significant meetings happening in the next couple of days. You guys know this because they've been talking to you, but the federal uh, agency, the federal folks behind the scenes that are responsible for taking the Farm Bill and putting it into practice, they've looked at what we've all worked so hard together on as the model. And one of the things that is confusing to many people in Washington is how can Colorado be seen as a model on hemp when it has marijuana? Because they don't understand our hardline distinction and what you said, ag versus however you want to characterize the marijuana regulatory system. So it's essential that we maintain that divide. We cannot have a marijuana regulatory agency involved whatsoever with hemp because it will harm us greatly at the federal level as they look at the implementation of the farm bill. Challenges, yes. We can solve those through, through creative solutions and working together. And we, we want to make sure that there's no diversion. We want to make sure that there's processes in place and that the economics of the industry remain the same so that the actors, it's just not worth your while to take, take that THC out of the system because then you lose this great economic opportunity to participate in the hemp world. And, and I think those are all the things that we're cognizant of. It's not easy. It's not an easy thing to do, but that's why we're all, we're all pausing. Uh, and just one note, maybe from the beginning. The reason the group called CHAG, for those of you that don't know, and, you know we kind of had this Colorado uh, legislative roundtable, hemp roundtable, which has largely been uh, home law group clients uh, and probably 20 or 30 uh, farmers and, and processors outside of our firm. Um, and we decided that that needed to be a step or two removed from the law firm, but most importantly, it needed to be broadened. So we've invited, we've got agricultural partners, stakeholders from outside of the industry. We've got farmers, we've got coalitions of lobbyists from other ag fields. One of the reasons Ben's involved is because of his deep connections with the, the Colorado agricultural community and his length of, of, of service to that industry. So we're looking at this as an ag play specifically, and we really want to maintain that hard line, uh, and we've broadened the coalition substantially. We sit here representing it. So you can be assured that if you're talking to Chad and if you're talking to Ben, if that information is, is, is on board with 75% or more of the existing industry within the state of Colorado, with absolute certainty. And we want to work with other groups, but at the same time, uh, it has to be in a process through which we're changing ideas and, and, and driving that agenda. So uh, I just wanted to stress that federal component because that hard line is not just important because we want ag and farmers to have a chance, but because the feds, if they see the blurring of the lines, and all of a sudden Colorado's not the model state, and Colorado is, for better or for worse, we have the responsibility of being a model state in the United States. Yeah. Do, do the agencies have any suggestions thus far? I mean, based upon your conversations interagency, interagency, interagency level amongst the agencies, do you have any proposals or suggestions? Where, where 
where you see this going or, or are you two? I think we're doing the same thing you are is sitting there waiting to see what comes out of the work week. Um, I think some, we have some ideas, but also waiting for that light bulb moment because there is a lot of um, potential areas that could blur the lines. Um, and how does that work within the regulatory framework? I think you want to have an understanding. I think you want to be prepared for a law enforcement um, group on um, the confusion this just readily causes for them at some points. Um, right, wrong, or different, it's the reality. It does create some confusion for them. So how do we provide some assured? That's the word I keep going back to. Even if it's I think that's a great a lot yeah. the surety of it. So we're open. Um, and we don't think everything has to be through statute and regs. Um, we started, you know, <coughs> all years ago within the policy statement just to try to get an understanding of the novelness of this industry and how, I mean, Tuesday looks different than next Tuesday. You know, it's not quite that place now, but it's still evolving. And just to have the nimbleness to evolve with it, um, I think is the key component. I'm going to add to something that Bob said, and that's, you know, Colorado, you know, when you look at the farm bill line, it mirrors a lot of things that we've done. It's moved a long ways from the last farm bill. And uh, I, I would agree with Bob. You know, I, my, my phone has rung off the hook the last 48 hours. And it isn't all from within the post and, 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 and hey, it was NBC. You know, it's, it's they are reaching out and why? Because so far, Colorado has not recruited hens to cross out the yard. And so many states have done that. And so how do we differentiate? Just a, a quick note to back, piggyback on this, especially as you bring these conversations forward. Um, the one thing I'm noticing here is maybe the best way to start this conversation is to look at how uh, the licensees underneath the med have to contend with hemp. Because it's not as if we don't have CBD mixed products in one to one or one to 16 ratios sitting on dispensary shelves legally. There's a component on how they can comply with that that allows everything to happen at the manufacturer to manufacturer level. So rather than even trying to maybe go too far down the rabbit hole, look at sort of the other side of that table and how people have to work around the existing framework of hemp and CBD to incorporate those products into you know that one-way channel over, um, I think would just be an interesting place to look. And I don't know that that representation's here uh, right now to give people an idea of what that infrastructure looks like for an infused products manufacturer to take now what is a food ingredient Right, and fuse that into a transdermal patch, or put that into a capsule, or put that into an edible uh, to create that that ratio of CBD to THC. So there may already be a solution here that defines a clear differentiation because of how we've defined the product. And I just want to uh, keep that in the back of our minds as maybe a starting point to this conversation, um, because I think it might be a little bit simpler than we're we're thinking it. Uh, you know, can go down and spiral in, in, in the sense of you know the fact that uh, hemp extract is treated as a food additive. And, and that's so already the answer. Is yeah, as a that, myth, you can buy any food ingredient. Right. I can put yeah. right chocolate yeah. brownie, yep. brownie totally mix, right. sugar, flour into my food products. Mm -hmm. It's not considered a food adulterant because it's right. an infused products manufacturing facility. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I already have a channel to get my CBD to my patients and to yes. my 21 and up rec users. Um, so that, that, that already exists, right? It's not explicitly put out in the med code. Uh, it is implicitly implied from the hemp code, right? So we're, we're pulling it in from that direction and we're compliant with it. Um, on the infused products manufacturing side without running in afoul of uh, you know this this mixing of metric tags and tracking of inventory because that stop control point is on that testing of that food grade product before it becomes an ingredient into THC infused products which then go through another round of testing because they've gone through a batch change a process change yeah. so <clears throat> from that perspective that framework exists and provides control I think the most important thing here is to protect public safety, right? Make sure mm -hmm. people aren't getting contaminated products or products that would otherwise make them sick, and then to have some degree of some control over the diversion factor once THC is in that product. Um, and I think you're you're absolutely right that our our real leadership challenge right now from Colorado outwards is making sure people know that this is not a psychoactive drug, that CBD is safe for human consumption, like St. John's wort or other active ingredients in nutraceuticals. Uh, and that we not try to you know throw that bone to the FDA and, and have a heavy set of federal regulations that then force our hand here in Colorado. We need to be the example of what show them uh, of workability and, and, and clear, transparent operations. Yeah, so um, a lot of unknowns right now. Uh, 
Um, what Katie and I are actually trying to do from a process standpoint is that we will always be in constant contact with the legislative liaisons. Um, we're anticipating some turnover in that space when we do the administration, and um, that um, any sort of conversations folks that are members or leaders in our association have with you guys will try to communicate and be as transparent as humanly possible because you know sunshine is the best disinfectant. Um, there's a few more little pieces we want uh, we wanted to hit on. Um, if that's okay with everyone. Um, there's a couple in the middle that are regulatory, but a couple things that might be done down the legislature. Um, water access, some, some river districts and, um, and dish companies are, are not allowing hemp farmers access to their, to their water um, based upon um, a misinterpretation of, <laughs> of, um, of, of, of the regulations in place. And so we just wanted to just stay on top of what that looks like um, in case anyone would drop a bill around that or have any, or have any conversation points. Another one is also single registration for people who are um, who have multiple plots of land um, maybe across a bigger geographic area. Um, you know, they'd still have to be based upon acreage and everything, but it would be easier just from a process standpoint to have one registrant fill out um, one registration form so they just have to go across where their properties are. Uh, I don't, we don't know if that's a statutory fix or a regulatory fix, so it's something that we don't know we're be able to have a conversation about. Maybe, maybe to pause there and forfeit the home and then we can the back here. And I think this came up when we were actually last year, uh, this summer, uh, you know, Terry and joined us, um, and that was something that we discussed was uh, this, this idea of single registration, how that does or doesn't comport with the CDH's administrative functions. And so I guess for the three of you, do you have strong feelings either way with respect to how that would operate, um, you know, for better or for worse in terms of trying to provide for some form of single registration options? Um, you know, I think that, you know, we certainly, I mean, I don't have a definitive answer other than I can I can understand. We want to do everything we can to streamline the processes, and so you know, I think we, from that perspective, and if we can, you know, see that as a streamlining in terms of looking for administrative burden, certainly we, we want to look at that. So I'm not sure how, and I think that's where that may be a statute in terms of how, how this may be done statutorily. Okay. Yeah. Um, that would just be super helpful because we definitely just have to go. Obviously, the regulatory path is a little easier. Yeah. Yeah, and that's fine. I, I would just note, I think something we did last year was that we, you know, clarified uh, some authority for the CBA to have flexibility on the fee structure, right? So, Me I mean, too. I, I, I understand that, but, you know, every time we raise a fee, yeah. we, have, uh, we have a considerable burden that we carry. Sure. And so if we're benefited, if you look at the number of registrations and the number of registrants, most are one-to-one. -one. Yeah. So we're asking for those few that have multiple registrations that pay less, but this, it will have to be spread across the other registrants in order to make the program fiscally sound. So, well, no, understood. Or, you know, like, for example, tiered, I, I'm just throwing out these are spitballing, but tiered structures or things like that, such that, you know, it's based on acreage or something, uh, from, from that perspective, in terms of being able to address some of those issues. And, and part of this comes up, you know, Marie, you and I recently spoke about, you know, I needed a handful long list of registration for one particular company. Integral to the hemp industry and compliance today is being able to show supply chain documentation. Showing your CDA registrations, your certificates of analysis, your CDPH regist uh, CDPHE registration, and so forth and so on. And so when you are continuously having to show batch documentation from a variety of different fields, it becomes very administratively difficult on the industry side to demonstrate compliance going forward, as opposed to simply saying, this hemp came from our fields under this one, one registration that all ties back to this registration. I think that's going to help unlock some things, but again, I think that's a discussion we're open to. Um, that's just you know, something that, that we've heard feedback on in terms of you know, trying to help stream up. Yeah, that, that helps I think, bring it a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely. Can I just ask a question why that may not work? is because isn't every registration required to do a planting report for that registered area, a harvest report for that registered area as well? So combining multiple 
areas or registrations under one, doesn't that complicate for I mean, CDA and what we're supposed more, to do? More cumbersome inside. That's why I think we probably need to just evaluate it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. you're right. Yeah. 10, 10 row sites, and we're asking for 10 planting. We'll have a hard time, which may be, a, may be an issue when we, when we start to have law enforcement call and say, is yep. this field planted? That's why it's, you know, it's, it's worth a conversation. I just don't know. Yeah. At this point in time, I don't know if we can commit. And that's fine. The point of this is to solve that conversation, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, the next issue we have um, is the, uh, uh, the bifurcation of hothead and after sampling. Um, basically, we're just trying to create a balance between sampling and testing protocols so the one negative sample doesn't ruin an entire harvest or registered area. Um, it could be addressed by implementing a certified genetics program alongside certified seed, but again, just kicking off this conversation, we just want to see what the department may think about that and how um, and how best we can move forward on that. It sounds like it's more of a regulatory issue as opposed to having to run an, an entire bill, but who knows, we might have to, so I just want to throw that out there for you guys to think about as well. Gary, I think we spoke to this when yeah. we were at Hugh Home Hunters earlier this summer in terms of if you have you know, one registered planting area and you have 20 different regions within that plant, you know, within that grow area um, that are segregated and stuff subject to separate testing. So then that way any one pop test doesn't render the entire field. And so just figuring out how to streamline that um, from the CDA's perspective, I know at that time CDA expressed some you know, administrative burden in terms of having 20 tests in that field, understandably so, but also wanted to make sure that you know the industry doesn't want to see a 100 acres or a thousand acres uh, go you know be rendered unusable by virtue of one hot test of, on one particular flower. Uh, I think that's just like the balancing act that people have to figure out how to implement that. I think in, in theory and in practice right now, I think the department's already there with their practice. Mm -hmm. um, the problem would be started saying what you're saying about a huge field and only have one thing uh, growing on that field mm -hmm. and that is what the sample is from it's never just one flower and then it mm -hmm. could be a whole sure. bag full of flowers mm -hmm. so <clears throat> um, the department you know the other thing you could do is do a composite sample of everything and you're still looking at the same thing yeah where you would have one thing hot and a whole whole planting as well understood I, I think it's just you know an issue that's kind of on the minds of folks in terms of just making sure that there's a way to not render entire crops or majority of crops unusable by virtue of that um and i, I mean i think that there's you know things that we look at there and again i think that's a discussion or conversation to be had to make sure that it's sensible from your perspective in terms of administering those policies but from an industry perspective it's not placing burden in terms of how do we put that in place and i think that also cuts into, I think, the sampling and testing protocol components as well, just in general. Yeah, and I think that, um, for a part of it ties into alternative methods of sampling. Um, you guys uh, take the top two inches out for testing right now. Um, there could be another form um, that could be used for testing. Um, I think Kentucky has a decent model that's been working for a number of years. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, we, we've heard, you know, from a number of folks that other states take homogenized samples, which would effectively allow for greater yields in, in uh, of a hemp plant. Um, and so Colorado ends up being more restricted in that sense, and it renders the ability to compete uh, you, know, you know, at times more difficult for, for a lot of folks. And so figuring out how, and some of those may come from the USDA through the farm bill, right, in terms of what sampling and testing protocols become. That's something we want to be thoughtful of. You know, Dwayne, for, uh, you said earlier today, Colorado's you know, made it work so far, right? We've done a lot of really good things. Well, this is something that other states are potentially or arguably being out called out on with respect to the competitiveness of it. And it's something that, you know, we have to be thoughtful in terms of how are we accomplishing this and does what the CDA does now work best for the industry or not just for the industry, but work best for the purposes of an industrial program or the better ways in which we can do it that provides the assurity that regulators and agencies want but also is beneficial and, and, and useful to the industry. I'm, I'm gonna tell you that more states are looking at what we're doing as the rules have changed federally. We've been using a lot of the facilities in the EPA, which is part of why Colorado is where we are. And that is that if we would have taken everything early on, we would no longer have to do any filtering. And so if 
other citizens who are in the community and are just now starting that process of looking at THD, of looking at how do we do material and process and still treat the farmer exactly the same as we do. So this has been a conversation for a number of years between the states. And you're right under the old farm bill, not even everybody kept the THDA. So we, we have, we, th this farm bill will take us a long ways and I think we'll help states come together. Uh, I work hard with the National Association Um, two more issues I just wanted to address. Um, so Nikki says the seas between CDPHE and Denver's <laughs> counterpart to you. Um, it's fairly clear that it uh, has a position of statewide concerns uh, and sometimes our localities are overstepping a little bit. Um, I, 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 again, we're not tied or married to any sort of policy solution to this, but we just want to make sure that the, the uh, folks in the, um, on the county and, 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 and the state governments don't go beyond what they're allowed to do by state law. And that's, um, not, that's not just a Department of Health thing. I know yeah. that's been one topic of conversation. I know there's other topics within Denver specifically in terms of does it go into the marijuana system and all. So there's a lot of different issues there. I guess the point is, is again, conceptually speaking, taking a step back, how do we draw a bright line between hemp and marijuana and have that be in existence at the state level? And how does that, do we ensure that that trickles down to the local levels as well? And part of that is that's just educating local leaders. Um, we're losing a fairly decent crop of local leaders due to term limits in a number of counties and cities. And it's incumbent upon us to go out and, and reach out to them. And we I, uh, we feel that you know once uh, it becomes common knowledge on the, on the good stuff that's in the farm bill, um, it will it'll hopefully further solidify that bright line between the ag commodity space and the drug and the drug enforcement space. Um, so speaking of that, one final thing we wanted to talk about was, was uh, possible funding for research and development. Um, there are some provisions in the farm bill that allow us to draw down some federal funds for that that could be matched by the state or could be augmented by the state. Um, they could really kind of put us at the forefront of, of, of that sort of research. Um, anything in particular that you guys would like to add to that? Uh, I think some of that's looking to the farm bill as it was passed and what happens with the USDA and the provisions through the current farm bill. I think part of that at the state level is stemming from last year's research authority bill and you know, picking up that conversation just, and again, it's not one specific methodology, but it's a, but a cumulative, you know, looking at all these conversations at the state and federal level, making sure that those, you know, those grant funds and other monies are uh, just as available, if not more easily accessible in Colorado uh, than other places. Exactly. Um, also, one final point, um, we're gonna be working together with our friends in the ag community um, to kind of get to know um, some of the incoming lawmakers. Um, we have a good number of new lawmakers on the rural affairs committee just in the house. Um, and so we're gonna just be creating some sort of like social events around that to kind of get everyone get to know one another. We'd love to include you guys in on that. Um, we have a lot of especially urban Democrats who think that oranges magically appear at Whole Foods. And we'd like to just um, help them understand that, you know, that's not what Foods have. <laughs> And also, you know, like ag, ag can truly still be a, a good bipartisan endeavor. Um, I used to work for the Rocky Mountain Farmers Union and I worked on all sorts of cool stuff when I was there. Um, but I also got really close and really worked really well with my friends at Farm Bureau and Cattle and the Wool Growers Bison Association. We grow small growers, a whole full spectrum. And um, I think a, a, um, something like hemp really can kind of help 